All right, well, thank you very much to the organizers. <laughs> Happy birthday, Srini. I took that picture. That's, uh, by the way, that's another ruminator, uh, <laughs> ruminant. Uh, it's a Trieste cow. I thought, uh, since I'm here in, in India, I should show you one of our lovely uh, Trieste ladies, uh, all dressed up naturally because uh, they're very fashionable in, in Italy. Um, that's actually up in the mountains. Um, <laughs> She's, she's ruminating right now and, and also emitting methane gas. All right, so uh, at any rate, Srini, um, uh, in honor of your birthday, actually, I, I was with Srini at another birthday party many years ago, 1995, and that's, uh, there's Srini up there. I think that's Bob Kerr kind of hovering behind. Uh, uh, but, um, and this is Russ Donnelly, whose birthday it was, that uh, Srini mentioned in his talk yesterday. And Russ is actually, that was another point, you know, Russ was a low temperature physicist, he was a, he was a fluid dynamics person, and, and nobody knew quite what to, what to label him as, and I, you know, I thought about it, and I think the problem is the labels, they're always just too restricting, so might as well just get rid of them, Srini, you're a learned man. Um, but at uh, uh, any rate, uh, the other guy that was there was Carl Wyman, and just a few weeks before, he had made that discovery of what was Einstein, or the observation in the laboratory. Uh, just down the street. Uh, this is in Boulder, so that we got that talk, and then maybe that was one of the first uh, talks on that uh, discovery. She later got the Nobel Prize. All right, so uh, uh, this is the, uh, you, you all know about the uh, Rayleigh Bernard convection, but this is just to uh, give you the, the kind of nomenclature that we'll use. So the, uh, the thermal uh, expansion coefficient, uh, kinematic viscosity, and the thermal diffusivity is so the Rayleigh number, which drives everything, the Prandtl number, and, and uh, aspect ratio, uh, which has been redefined for turbulence problems. Uh, so it's uh, the, the uh, full horizontal extent divided by the vertical extent. And the uh, response is always, uh, and one of the responses is the Nussel number, that, which represents the dimensionless heat transport across the layer, and that's very important for a number of problems. So here's some problems. Uh, solar convection, you heard about, the convection in the outer core, which gives rise to the magnetic field, convection in the mantle, which is not turbulent at all, even though it's high Rayleigh, because the Reynolds number is essentially one. All right, so anyway, that's the, that's the problem. And, uh, and so at onset, when you go from a conducting fluid to a, to a convecting fluid, that's pretty much completely understood now. Um, nice rolls, and if you, uh, if you look at a cylinder from above, you see Boundary conditions actually make quite a bit of difference. If you have different kinds of boundary conditions, you might see the shape of the cylinder, or you might not, uh, but they always uh, make a difference. They also make a difference in turbulent flows, uh, which wasn't obvious to some of us coming to turbulence later in life. Uh, so at uh, Rayleigh-Bernard convection, under turbulent conditions, very high Rayleigh number, uh, that being the difference, uh, you have plumes. And the plumes arise because you have uh, very thin boundary layers now where all the temperature gradient is, uh, is across. And so these are highly stressed regions. They may be about 100 microns, something of order 100 microns in our experiments. And so if you can imagine all the temperature drop across that 100 microns, uh, what happens when they become, they, they immediately become unstable. And instead of the nice rolls happening, you get bursts of plumes. Um, and those plumes are driving this flow. Actually, the Rayleigh number or the unstable density gradient drives the flow, but you might say the plumes are in the driver's seat. That would be the uh, Nicky Lauda uh, driving a Rayleigh Ferrari. Uh, at <clears throat> any rate, so they, these plumes uh, are emitted from the, both the top and the bottom, and they, they tend to circulate. They create a mean uh, wind, and, uh, and that mean wind can also undergo various reversals. Uh, I put it in quotes because it's not necessarily a reversal. It just means if you put a probe at any given point in the upstream or the downstream, you'll see, the, uh, see that change sign. All right, so that's a, another interesting thing we'll get back to. All right, so these experiments um, that I'll describe used helium. I think Laddick, Laddick mentioned a little bit of this. Uh, this is the phase diagram again. Uh, but. Uh, for, for, for these kind of classical experiments with convection, we, we operate in the vapor phase and the helium gas, and more or less in that, that's uh, more or less in this, uh, this uh, shaded region. Uh, and in that shaded region, which gets up near the critical point, you get about 12 orders of magnitude 
of uh, variation in Rayleigh number, and that's been mentioned before. Uh, well, what you want to do with the Rayleigh number is, is get a large height uh, in your apparatus, and that means you move all 12 orders of magnitude up into the turbulent regime, and uh, that's especially important if you want to see scaling. All right, and then it's also important to get the highest Rayleigh number uh, that you can. All right, so anyway, that's, that's the idea. And, uh, well, here's the first, uh, here's some heat transfer results. The Nusselt number, again, is the dimensionless heat transport. Uh, this is just a, uh, a broad result, um, and it's actually quite, it's almost historical now. It goes back to 2000. Um, but you'll see that over this wide range, there's about 11 orders of magnitude. Um, uh, you get a heat transport that, where the effective conductivity, is this still on? Okay. Uh, uh, increases by about uh, by a factor of 20,000 over conducting uh, uh, the conducting material. Um, and I put the just to get back getting back to the cow theme. Uh, you know, from a distance, all cows look black, and 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 certainly if you zoomed in here, you would see uh, variations locally. But on a if you're, you really want to get a number, uh, that's a pretty good line um, at any point. All right, so there's, uh, there's, there's a lot more going on lately concerning what this exponent might be, but I'm going to leave that, and I, I'll just uh, wish that we, we get a, a nice new, larger apparatus, which I think is coming to Gutingen, um very soon. All right, so uh, anyway, that's, uh, that's that, uh, uh, the, the main heat transport and, and the problem. Now, this one I want to dedicate to Charles because this is, I'll just talk about a few crazy ideas, and I, I got inspired by, by his talk uh, on the first day. Uh, so I want to open up a can of worms, or maybe it's a can of sand. Um, but let's look at the, the, if you take the advection diffusion equation, and you do the typical decomposition and averaging over fluctuations, uh, you get this expression for the vertical heat flux, and, and rho is the density, this is the specific heat. Uh, theta is the, the, the uh, fluctuation, fluctuating part, uh, about the mean of the temperature, and, and u, here's the, the fluctuating part of the vertical velocity, and kappa is the molecular thermal diffusivity, and t is the mean temperature, that's the gradient. All right, so the, so the crazy part is, if you just want to play around like Charles did, and I, and I bring it up because I want to show you you can actually do this, um, you can replace uh, this correlation between uh, uh, velocity and, and uh, temperature fluctuations was something that looks like um, a turbulent fluid, <laughs> if such a thing actually existed. Um, and I even, I even thanked you in the, in the text here. Um, and if you do that, you can rearrange this all to, to find the Nusselt number. Uh, can just be given by this effective kappa uh, diffusivity uh, divided by the molecular one. And the effective one is just the, the sum of the of the molecular and the, and the turbulent uh, um, diffusivity. So the turbulent one would be defined here. And so the effective one is what's in the flow, which is uh, both conduction and, and turbulent convection. All right, so, uh, and it should be much bigger because the turbulence will make a, a considerably larger diffusivity. All right, so it actually works. Um, it works pretty well, so, that's, so this is aspect ratio one. Uh, these, these are the, uh, the points, just the normal Nusselt number measured in the usual way. Um, and that, that open circle is actually a value of uh, the effective diffusivity measured in the cell divided by the molecular diffusivity. It, it really works better than I thought it should. And uh, so the question was, how did we measure the effective diffusivity? It's not exactly obvious. And so we went to our uh, favorite book that Srini showed in his talk yesterday. Or maybe you didn't, no, you showed Chandra's. But this is another one. If you have Chandra Sekar's hydrodynamics, uh, you should also have Carl Slaw and Jaeger's uh, conduction of heat in solids. And I, and I threw in a little extra part. Um, and so the idea, if you go, you go in there, and I think it's chapter four, uh, if you have something like a, a very strange rock that uh, came from the middle of the earth, you wanted to know what the diffusivity was, it has lots of components, the best way is to is to shave off the ends, make it flat, and then apply an oscillating heat source. And you, you send in, by doing that, you, uh, in this case, here's our convection cell, and we have a top constant uh, temperature as usual, but at the bottom, 
we have the, the, the uh, higher temperature plus an oscillating component, and you simply oscillate uh, a signal inside. Uh, that's like a heat wave. It's not actually a heat equation we're going to solve, but it acts like a wave. It propagates. It has a phase uh, and has a velocity. And, uh, and, this, and so the uh, equation you want to solve is this one. And so this is the preposterous part that I, that I uh, uh, will blame on Charles. Uh, so you really treat this fluid like, this turbulent fluid like a, uh, like a, a rock um, and solve for the effective diffusivity. The solution to that equation is this, uh, when under these conditions, with those boundary conditions, and so the temperature uh, at that frequency um, has an exponential decay. It also has a phase change. Uh, so you can, uh, so I didn't actually uh, uh, put that in. Uh, sorry, this is a partial solution. There's also another part which has a, the uh, cosine in it. So this is the solution for the amplitude, and the amplitude decays exponentially, and that uh, this uh, effective length is a Stokes uh, length. Um, same with a uh, vibrating uh, oscillation. Uh, you'd have one in momentum, but uh, so that's the, twice the uh, effective conduct. Uh, thermal diffusivity divided by the frequency. So that's, that's how you measure uh, effective thermal diffusivities in materials. And, uh, and it actually worked pretty well uh, in this case. Uh, and that's actually, that, this is a picture of the, um, uh, the, the actual raw signal. And so this is the Fourier spectrum of the fluctuations of temperature in the center of the cell on the mid-plane. It's actually a little bit off, off center. Um, uh, well, actually, we have them in the center of two. Um, and so this is, uh, this is the noise level. Now, the noise level is our normal signal. Uh, so that reminds me of something Russ Donnelly always told me, that uh, uh, one, one person's noise is another person's signal. Um, but this is the signal that we're getting. So by, by uh, oscillating here, we get this huge spike, and we can measure uh, that, that uh, amplitude, the amplitude spectrum. So you immediately read off the RMS amplitude. And so if you take the RMS of this, you can compare them and, and hence solve for the effect of diffusivity, diffusivity. So it works pretty well. And by the way, this is aspect ratio four. So that's not, exact, that's not really a coincidence. We found it also with a, a four times smaller height and a different aspect ratio, and both in the cell center and the cell. And this is where you can see the other person's signal because that little lump right here, we oscillated at the mean, uh, the frequency of the mean wind. So you can see that. Uh, on the side, but on the center, you don't see it, which makes a lot of sense. All right, anyway, so that's, uh, you can read all about it here. Um, the problem is it doesn't work at high Rayleigh number. It really breaks down. When it works at low Rayleigh number, it's within a percent of what uh, we get normally measuring Nussel numbers. So that, that remains a mystery. Uh, and and uh, we're planning, we're making a, a, distribu a distributed sensor array to, to, to take another look at this problem. Uh, I think it's quite interesting, actually. Um, all right, so uh, I'm going to move on to another topic, and that's rotation. This one is, is really complex. Uh, it was already, a, Rayleigh Binard convection is a very simple system when you look at it, but it's actually a complex flow. And now when you throw in rotation, uh, you, you add in other parameters. So there, there's a rate at which you rotate. By the way, this is the apparatus. And, there's a little uh, lazy Susan <laughs> that we're going to rotate, and we put it back down in that pit. Um, so you, you make a dimensionless rotation rate, and that's the Ekman number to the minus one, uh, and the Taylor number is that. Now, that's very high in, in helium. With helium, you can get up to 10 to the 14. That's three orders of magnitude higher, at least, than the, than the best competitor with different kinds of gas or, or different kinds of fluids. Uh, you also have a convective Rossby number, which compares time scales of rotation and buoyancy. Uh, that's the same for all fluids. It doesn't really matter. Those parameters really don't change from one experiment to the other. So you have no advantage with helium for Rossby number. But it turns out the Taylor number or the Ekman number is, is a more important parameter for what I'm going to talk about. And that's <laughs> this heat transfer, which is actually in the geostrophic regime where rotation really dominates. Now, that's a difficult regime, geostrophic turbulence, so that's a difficult regime uh, to enter. And in fact, you really need to, to move down uh, to, to helium temperatures in, in some sense uh, to get this. Um, and just to give you an idea, this is really complex, but I'll, I'll try, to, uh, try to explain a little bit. 
Uh, this is the nestled number. It's normalized by the nestled number without rotation. That's a nestled a zero. Um, and so if I look at one of these things, uh, you're, you're up here at a very large Ekman number where the rotation doesn't matter. You just get one. Uh, it's just whatever you, it's the turbulent convective value. And at some transition, you start getting more influence of rotation. And then at this transition, you really get geostrophic turbulence. Um, and to make a law, and you do this at a number of Ekman numbers. Um, and so we've made this plot. Uh, this is a phase diagram, and this is the main point of what we did. Um, so as a function of Ekman number, smaller and smaller Ekman number, by the way, uh, natural systems are way up there, Ekman number minus uh, 10 to the minus uh, 20 or so. So uh, we have a long ways to go. The idea of this was to try to get some kind of uh, intuition or some kind of understanding of the complex uh, um, relationships between different parameters and especially the heat transport. And um, so at any rate, so these are our points. Uh, we can also get Prandtl number, this is Prandtl number 0.7, which is the, the, the ideal gas. So we can also get up to six and, and compare it with water. But I'm just going to talk about the shaded region. That's geostrophic uh, turbulence. Um, it exists around, above around Rayleigh over Rayleigh crit of three. Rayleigh crit is a rotation-based uh, value by Kandasekar. And these are water experiments, and they have no rains. Uh, there's no way for them to access the geostrophic region. Uh, we can with the helium. We can at least get to here. It's an extremely difficult uh, experiment. It's probably the most difficult one we ever attempted. Um, but we get the idea uh, that if you want to get some scaling, you need some at least a decade. We didn't quite get it, but we got something like nestled to Rayleigh to the one power. That's this line uh, in that region. And that's, uh, so that's the best we know at the moment. Okay, so that's, uh, you can read about it here as well and here uh, for some of the other things. All right, so that's uh, rotation. Now I want to talk about something different uh, in the last part. Najme, uh, our student, uh, Najme Frutzani, uh, couldn't get her visa. Uh, she's an uh, Iranian citizen. Uh, she really didn't want to try to take the chance and joke around with the tourist visas, so, and I understand that. So I, I, I thought it was very important to, to show uh, who she is and uh, show some of her work. Uh, so this is work with, uh, with Srini and also Vincenzo Armenio, whose code we use. So we'll all talk about uh, large eddy simulations, and they're also code with a lot of input uh, from the ideas of Charles Minivo. All right, so um, this is just it. Uh, and, and please don't ask me too many questions about the code. Uh, I'm, I'm really there for the convection. But it's a large eddy simulation um, uh, in 3D. Uh, uh, it's a cubic cell, and that was, that's actually important. Um, and so it's gamma equal one. Uh, Prandtl number is 0.7, so it looks like our experiments. Uh, Rayleigh number 10 to the 6 and 10 to the 8. All right. Um, it's a low, low mesh, but we're running uh, really on a shoestring budget. And uh, all right, so the, the rest of it is there. Um, so some of the features, and by the way, it's really, it's been a real, real joy because we can actually ask some questions we've been wondering about and get answers. And, uh, and the cube is a little bit different than the cylinder. All, most experiments are cylinders, uh, and that's just because you can make walls thin and, and be, you have this pressure gradient across the wall. So cylinders, spheres work much better than cubes, um, generally. So... Uh, but the cylinders have this sort of freedom, azimuthal freedom that cubes don't have. And so what happens in a cube, and in this case we're really interested in the large scale flow, is it gets pinned in the, in the, along one of the diagonals. And so this is what it looks like. Um, flow goes up in the diagonal, goes across. As it goes up, there's a corner eddy here. And now if you look, what's happening in the other diagonal? The other diagonal, there's a big counter-rotating vortex. Uh, two vortices. So there's one here going up and in, and one here going down, and, and same on the other side. That's really easy to understand if you look at the top. Uh, this is the horizontal velocity uh, um, whole, whole vector, and, and so what you see is the here's the top plate. For instance, the, the flow comes up here at this spot, so there's no horizontal velocity, and it spreads everywhere as it, it has to do. It also spreads behind, and that's the corner eddy. And on the bottom plate, it hits down at the bottom, spreads everywhere, also behind. 
And, uh, and as it goes off to the other corners, it has to go down, it has to go somewhere. And so that's, that's the origin of this. And in fact, it has to come right to the center and go in. And so you see, if you look at the horizontal midplane uh, and look at horizontal velocity, um, there's, a, there's a big uh, component here uh, when this is the, uh, the, the corner eddies here. It doesn't go all the way in, it, it comes back around like this. All right, so that's the uh, morphology. You can read about it in those papers. Uh, what we see are reorientations of the large-scale flow. I can go this way, that way, <laughs> that way, and that way. Um, and uh, in between are transient states. So even though it's, it's, uh, it can only be in the diagonal, it can stay for one circulation time uh, along a parallel to a wall. That's, very, that's unstable, um, but that's how it transitions. So it never reverses. Well, we never observed a reversal. Uh, right as it's in there, it always is moving around. That's how it's changing its, uh, its direction. And these are the transient states. So all, in all, there's eight discrete flow states, and that's it. There are no other flow states uh, that we see, and, and, and uh, uh, four of those are, are unstable. They're just transients. Okay, so you can read about it here. Uh, and this is what signals look like to experiments. Uh, I just show you this because as an experimentalist, uh, if I, if I put a probe in the midplane, if I saw this signal, okay, so that's, uh, the, this, this is the outlay, the orientation of the probes at the midplane. If I saw this sort of signal, I know what that means. Uh, that's uh, P8, it's right here, so it's, it's, it's going up here. And that's P4 down here, so it's going down. So I, oh, there's a, there's, a, um, there's a mean flow going in that diagonal. But if I look simultaneously at the other diagonal, I see this big mess. And I said, well, if I was an experimentalist and I saw that, I'd really have to reverse engineer and try to figure out what that was. And so it's zero mean with a big fluctuation, and that's just the counter-rotating flow. So if you see the simulation, it makes a lot of sense. If you didn't do it and you did the experiment first, you would be scratching your head for a long time. All right, so anyway, so the main thing I want to say is we, we added some roughness elements recently. This is unpublished work, but soon to be published. Um, and we did it in two ways. One was with pyramids. The pyramids have no direction to them. Uh, they're 3D objects, you might say. And the other are grooves. And, and <laughs> what I told Najme, Najme, make the grooves go parallel to a sidewall. Uh, and the reason for that is the grooves actually emit the plumes. Where there's a sharp point, uh, that's where plumes come off. And if you put it parallel to the sidewall, you're going to direct the mean wind that way. That was the idea. And that's not where it wants to go. And uh, so that was just to be, uh, uh, just to be, have a, a little practical joke was convection. There's the mesh. And so here's the result. The grooves, when it's hydrodynamically smooth, that means the groove height is smaller than the thermal boundary layer length. It, 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 the flow doesn't know that there's a the groove there. Um, and uh, you get the same diagonal flow when the, the, the conditions are rough, so in other words, the, the height of the groove, or the height of the peak, uh, is larger than the thermal boundary layer length, you get flow on time average flow, which is parallel to the sidewall. That's not stable otherwise. Um, and then pyramids, smooth or rough, it's always in the diagonal, as it would be if you never had any roughness at all. And that makes sense. All right. Well, actually, it might have been different, but that's what you get. Um, so this is the interesting part. And so if you look at, again, you look at these things, you sort of look at the experimental signal at the midplane, uh, you see that there's flow. These two, don't worry about it. It's a little bit noisy. It's just like the other one I showed you, but it shows flow going like this and flow simultaneously going like that, which can't really happen. Um, and if you look at the Fourier transform, uh, you find out that it's, it's really alternating between those two, and the mean is along the, this direction. So it's along. So when you say the time average, when you look at the time average, it looks like it's flow parallel to a sidewall, which is unstable. What it's really doing is just oscillating. It's going from one diagonal to the other. It doesn't know where to go. Uh, it knows it just doesn't want to go parallel to the sidewall. I'm attributing a lot of human. Sorry, is that time? Yeah, T eddy is a, yeah, uh, yeah. T eddy is the time for for one roll. We found that's a, a much better uh, a way to normalize time than say freefall velocity, uh, based on freefall velocity. Um, 
So uh, anyway, so it's oscillating back and forth. So it, it really is unstable. Time average is that line, and that's what you see. All right, so um, the last thing I'm going to say, and I've got five minutes. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this is the first thing I asked Najbe to do, uh, just because, uh, well, this is the first little project she did. And, um, and it, was a, it was a question, uh, this is a nice paper by Daya and Eki, a Fizzer of Letter in 2001. And what they found was they, they had a, two inserts in their convective apparatus, a cylindrical one and a cubic one. I said, ah, let's see what the difference is. And so they, 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 they uh, performed the, the experiments. And they looked at the fluctuations at the cell center, uh, the small, the RMS fluctuations of velocity and temperature, and they found they were radically different. And so this is, these are, for instance, temperature fluctuations. Uh, this is the, uh, for a cube, and this is for a cylinder. And they looked around in the literature, and they didn't find anything. If anybody did an experiment in the cube, they never talked about fluctuations. They did it in the cylinder, they said, oh, we get something like radius of the minus 0.15. Um, and so that was really curious. Um, I guess I, the, uh, <laughs> the term limits up. I, I actually reviewed the paper, um, and I thought, well, it looks pretty odd to me. Why would it be different in a cube based on the shape with the same aspect ratio? Uh, but, it, you know, Bob's a good experimentalist, so let's go. <clears throat> and it's radically different. Um, and so that, that was the first project. And I said, well, not, I mean, this is actually a really good, you, you have a cube, let's see what it is. We'll just do a numerical experiment. Um, and you saw some of those early on. And so our results in the cube were uh, for density, density and temperature are the same, um, uh, 0.46. So it's, it's within the air bars of uh, Becky's uh, result, as, as is, uh, are the uh, fluctuations of velocity. So really, that, uh, that was the first uh, sort of uh, confirmation that, that, that these results were okay, uh, and you can read about that one in this, in this first paper. All right, so I wanna, here's my conclusions. So I, I'm, I'm going to let uh, Alan Newell and Zakharov speak for me. Uh, so this was from a, a Turbulence a Tentative Dictionary uh, back in 1994, the year before Srini and I were at Russ's birthday party, and um, and their conclusion is simple fluids are easier to, easier to drink than to understand. And, and these guys should know that uh, if you know them. <clears throat> and, but I, I think there's another way to put that, and that's uh, simple fluids are easier to understand if you drink. Um, all right. <laughs> okay, well, thanks. <laughs> uh, thank you, sir. We can take a few questions. That's my other job, by the way. Okay, I'm a dancer. Yeah, Joe, uh, this reversals uh, in cube, we can understand by, well, I don't think it is a reorientation. Uh, we, we have a modes uh, which are, in fact, uh, parallel to the face. Yep. That is a mode which is excited first time, in, according to Rele Bernard. Mm -hmm. the two of them, they interact, and that leads to effective roll along the diagonal. So we can discuss that part. So we have figured that out. Okay, well that's that's great. Um, we never saw we never saw actually a reversal. And what I mean by a reversal is it goes around and it stops, like uh, like convection in a, in a tube, like the Lorenz equation model, uh, and then it stops and then it restarts going around. That that one we never observed. And, and so what we observed in every single case is it just migrates around, and in between are these states which I call transient because they exist for one or two uh, cycles of the mean wind. Uh, and so that's what I mean by transient. But then it goes to the next diagonal. But I, I'm very interested in that. I'll, I'll let's take a look. Uh, mode inside that's excited by that. And it's probably only a few millimeters a second that it passes the frequency of the rotation rate. Um, but it may be interesting to consider the interaction of the precessional flow with the vector flow. And that's a very real phenomenon in terms of planetary atmosphere. That's a really good that's a really good comment. Right. Exactly. 
That's a really good comment. If this hadn't been such a, an extremely difficult experiment to do in the first place, we might have even thought about, it, about that. But that's actually a good comment for, uh, and we we do plan. By the way, what that tells you is you need to go to smaller Ekman numbers. That's a real challenge. Uh, these, it was already a challenge to get down to where we got. Uh, but if you really want to know anything about geostrophic turbulence, you gotta gotta keep going. Joe, jo, in, in your simulations with the roughness, is there any indication of ultimate regime in that, in that case? Have you looked at that? Uh, well, I, okay. yeah, we haven't looked at that yet because I haven't even seen, this is still unpublished, I haven't even seen the heat transfer results. Um, yeah, right, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, we will look at that, but this is, again, down at 10 to the 8th, so I'm not sure. Uh, you know where you see you see the ultimate regime is when you, you take the model, you take the model for the uh, uh, diffusive fluid, and uh, and just call it uh, turbulent. Um, then you actually get something that looks like ultimate regime, which makes sense because it's all turbulent. But no, we haven't looked at that, but I, I'm not sure I'm going to see that because. It, so I don't know whether right the Rayleigh of ten to the eight, whether with a rough surface you'd expect ultimate regime. I, you I, 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 I you wouldn't. I don't think so, no. Patterns that you show, uh, they may uh, get completely uh, different if, uh, or they may lose symmetries in case the fluid was uh, one which had a very sensitive temperature viscosity uh, behavior. So if the cold and hot parts had very different viscosities, some uh, of this. I, well, so yeah, good point. I mean, we're assuming in all this uh, that the Boussinesq approximation holds and that there are no temperature dependencies of any of those properties except for density. Um, so <laughs> that's the quick answer. Uh, but if there were strong dependencies on temperature, uh, actually all the, all the analysis has to be redone because then you're in a non boussinesq regime and, uh, and, and things are... Even if not, Okay, well, let's talk about that after. Yeah, that's very interesting. Any more questions? Uh, in one of your initial slides, you show the uh, nasal number exponent as, uh, as uh, 0 0.32. The Rala number is 0 0.32. Right. So uh, is it uh, quite different from the, uh, the ultimate regime of uh, 0.5 exponent? Yeah, uh, the ultimate regime is not... 0.5, uh, that's it's 0.5 divided by a logarithmic correction. So I mean, if you work through the numbers, it's, it's something more like point, uh, 0.38 or something for. Um, so it, it is a little bit different, yeah. Uh, that's an average, by the way. I, I just drew a line from small to, to large that was corrected for sidewalls at the, at the bottom and corrected for, uh, and that tilted it up a little bit. The original result was 0.31. Uh, and also for the uh, imperfect thermal uh, forcing, uh, the BO, BO effect uh, at the top. So when you make those adjustments, but again, that's why I said all cows look black from a distance, because if you zoomed in, you would see you know, some structure, you see different kinds of slopes. Uh, but we see this on it. I mean, Laddick can, can answer these questions really, really well, because he's, they're doing experiments up in, in, uh, in Brno, I guess, uh, to, to address these, these, uh, this issue. Um, but no, this, this is quite different than, than what we'd expect from that. Joe, I wanted to ask you about the experiment to infer diffusivity, at okay. that, that problem. Uh, so you were imposing a time-dependent uh, oscillatory boundary condition on top of the temperature change that was yeah. already there. Right. So there are parameters, namely the frequency and the amplitude of that oscillation. And so have you varied yeah. uh, okay. the frequency in particular to see? Yeah, no, the... no, yeah, we did. <clears throat> um, a very good question, thanks for asking, because I didn't actually show the amplitude. You might have seen it on the plot. Uh, we went from very small amplitudes to amplitudes were comparable to the temperature difference across the cell, huge amplitudes. Uh, now the, the one thing that was so, we did the whole gamut, uh, and so in that case, really, we didn't see any, any differences in amplitude. It was really remarkable. Even when at high amplitudes, 
Uh, it shows that if you measure an average quantity, you, you, you integrate over cycles of the oscillation, you still get the same Nusselt number measured normally. Um, what we didn't do is vary, we varied the frequency as well. We, we hit it at the, the, the mean uh, frequency of the, of the, of the uh, mean wind, uh, but we also went lower. We didn't really go much higher. If you go higher, you don't get a signal. So it shows it works. But uh, the original experiment was never designed to look at that. This is completely <laughs> re-engineered because the original experiment was to uh, add some periodic forcing to the mean wind and see if we can change its, its uh, statistics. And the answer is no, we didn't, uh, but we were in the wrong frequency regime. Uh, and so we, we, we analyzed this a little bit differently, and uh, that's why we went back to this. Okay, but so we did vary both those things. Um, so we can carry on this discussion to the tea session and uh, let's thank the speaker again for this wonderful talk. <laughs>